welcome back. And well, first things first, if my face looks a little red, uh, it's not a trick of the light. I actually took the uh, Isuzu Bellet out to the local autocross over the weekend. And I got quite a lot of sun. I didn't take any sunscreen with me and uh, my nose is reflecting that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Uh, today what I want to do is I want to take a quick look at a interesting little piece that I picked up on my last trip to Computer Reset. For those that don't know, Computer Reset is a massive warehouse that was full of just unbelievable amounts of stuff. <laughs> it's hard to pin down exactly what was in Computer Reset because a little bit of everything was in computer reset. Uh, I cannot do it justice explaining it here, but LGR has some excellent videos on it, so I definitely recommend checking out those videos. Unfortunately, I believe that computer reset is starting to close down for good. They've moved most of the inventory out. Uh, so a couple of weeks back, I took one final trip to kind of pay my respects, but also pick up anything that might be of interest. And I grabbed a couple calculators and uh, some other bits and bobs, but this caught my eye and I really wanted to take a look inside of it. It is a night photoelectric relay system, and this is the receiver unit. Um, I believe that there is another unit called the exciter unit, which I think is just essentially a light bulb, uh, but I, I didn't see it there and so I don't have it. All I've got is the receiver unit, but this in and of itself is still very, very cool. Uh, so I want to put it on the bench, show you guys what exactly it is that it does, and then we'll take the case off of it and see if we can't figure out how it works on the inside. So let's hop over there and get started. All right, here's the unit itself. You can see that it's pretty Spartan. It's a night photoelectric relay system receiver unit model KG-833. And on the front, all we have is a lens and a on off switch uh, with a low to high sensitivity adjustment. And uh, that's it. Uh, there's nothing on the sides, on the top or on the bottom. Uh, but if we flip it around to the back, we get a little more clue about what's going on. We have our AC 117 volt in, this just plugs into the wall. Then we have another outlet down here for AC 117 volts. Uh, so somehow AC is coming in and AC is coming out and we're controlling that with the controls on the front. But we also have this intermittent switch up here and its behavior is quite interesting too. Uh, but in order to demonstrate it and to, uh, well, demonstrate what the entire thing does, we need to find something to plug into the back of it. And the ideal thing for uh, quick simple testing would be uh, just a light bulb, but uh, I don't happen to have a light bulb socket that I can wire up correctly. Uh, and since we're dealing with 117 volts, I don't want to get something janky going on. Uh, so instead, I'm just going to use my little uh, Sony television here. So we'll just plug it into the back here and then we will turn this on and set the sensitivity to, I don't know, about halfway up. And yeah, there we go. We can see that my uh, Sony television has turned on. Now the Sony television itself is just displaying white and not static, no matter what channel I put it on. Uh, so it's going to need a little bit of work in the future. Uh, but right now I'm more curious about this receiver unit. Uh, we can see that, well, the TV's on, so that means that AC power is passing straight through. Now the counterpart to this that I'm missing is the exciter system, which I believe is just a light with a lens to focus it, so you get a beam of light that goes straight into the sensor here. So since I don't have that, instead I'm just going to use a tiny little flashlight. And you can see I've got it on, and if I shine this flashlight into the lens here, we can see my TV turned off. And if I take the flashlight away, my TV kicks back on again. Uh, so whenever light is being shown into the actual lens, it cuts off AC power from passing through. And then whenever something breaks that beam of light, the power can pass through and we get AC powering my beautiful little Sony TV here. Now that intermittent switch on the back is really interesting. So if we imagine that the normal state of the machine is with light shining into it, and then I flip the intermittent switch on, 
Now, right now, no power is passing through. But if I break the beam, we can see that the TV turns on. However, if I shine the light back in there again, well, the TV doesn't turn off again. As a matter of fact, nothing I do will turn the TV off. So all you have to do is break the beam once and then power will pass through until you either turn the item off using the uh, power switch on the front or you turn the intermittent switch off in the back. And so if we shine our light into the lens and then we turn the intermittent switch off, we can see that the power has kicked off. And then if I take my light away, again, power kicks on and we're working normally. So for something that seems incredibly simple at first glance, it has a lot of really interesting and complex behavior. Uh, and I just find that fascinating. So let's pull the case off of it and see if we can't figure out how it's doing what it's doing. And here we go, it looks remarkably clean inside. Uh, and I guess that makes sense, it needed to be sealed from any outside light working its way in, unless it was through the actual lens at the front here. Uh, and well, that all that light sealing means that not a whole lot of dust or corrosion or anything got inside, and it looks really nice. And there's really not too many components to it. We have a fuse here. Oh, and uh, by the way, I have unplugged it from the wall, so uh, don't worry about me poking my fingers in here. I won't get shocked. Uh, but we have a fuse here. We have a little transformer back there. Uh, and then we have a PCB right here that has one transistor, four resistors, two diodes, a large capacitor, and the photocell. And the photocell is huge, but light can only get to it through this tiny little hole in this uh, blocking plate right here. And the PCB looks to be fairly simple. It's just a single-sided PCB and all of the traces on the back are very visible. Uh, so I should be able to create a schematic for exactly what is going on inside of here uh, relatively easily. So uh, I'll get back to you guys as soon as I have that schematic finished. All right, here's the schematic best as I can figure out for what's going on inside of this thing. And uh, I think we can figure out what's happening. Uh, we have our AC 120 volt plug coming in on the left here. Uh, and then we have the power switch. And well, the power switch and the potentiometer over here on the far right are actually the same unit. Uh, but because they go to wildly different places, I had to draw them separately on the schematic here. Now when we turn that power switch on, we get a complete circuit through the primary winding of the transformer. And we also get a connection to one pin of our AC out. Now if we look at the secondary winding of our transformer, uh, we can see that one side of it goes through a diode, then a 3.3 ohm resistor, and then finally to a 47 microfarad 50 volt capacitor. And that's that big blue capacitor that's sitting on the top of the PCB up here. Uh, and this creates a uh, half wave rectifier. However, because it's a half wave rectifier, whenever we put a heavy load onto the circuit, it's going to experience a little bit of ripple. As a matter of fact, I checked the voltage across the 47 microfarad capacitor here. And when the relay is not engaged and there is no load on it, uh, it sits at just about 20 volts. But as soon as the relay kicks over, puts a heavy load on it and it drops down to about 16 volts DC. And so what I think we're seeing is a uh, ripple starting to show up on the positive line there. So we have our positive on the top, our negative on the bottom, and uh, moving left to right, we have a 47 ohm resistor and a 2.7 thousand ohm resistor going from positive to ground. And uh, we pull off for the emitter of the transistor out of that voltage divider. Now, this is actually the only part of the circuit that I'm really not sure about. I'm not entirely sure why they chose to use a 2.7 thousand ohm resistor to ground here. So if anybody has an idea about that, uh, let me know in the comments, I'm really curious. But we come out of the center tap of this uh, voltage divider and we go into the emitter of our PNP transistor. Now, BJTs are fascinating devices and I could make 
uh, probably a couple hour long videos on them and only start to scratch the surface of exactly what's going on inside of them. I mean, there's entire textbooks written about these things. Uh, but I'll try to explain what's going on as simply as I can because, well, that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge about them. I'm a vacuum tube guy. These uh, transistor things are uh, pretty much black magic to me. Uh, but as I understand it, for PNP, there's going to be a certain amount of current flowing from the emitter through the base to ground. Uh, and we can control the amount of current that's flowing through that by, uh, well, the interesting resistor collection that we have over here on the far right. Uh, we have a 2.2 thousand ohm resistor and the LDR going to ground, but we also have this 8.8 thousand ohm potentiometer, and that's the sensitivity control that we have on the front. Now, I'm not too sure that I got the uh, resistance measurement on the potentiometer correct. Um, it's kind of hard to measure a potentiometer in circuit and get a proper value for it, but I think this is correct. But either way, what this potentiometer is doing is it's allowing us to adjust the potential that the base is sitting at. Now, going back to the transistor, if there is, for example, 0.1 milliamps flowing from emitter into the base all the way to ground, the transistor itself will try to amplify that between the emitter and the collector. Uh, so if we have 0.1 milliamps, it'll try to amplify that by some huge factor and it'll try to move, say, 10 milliamps from the emitter to the collector. Now, all of those values were just random numbers I picked off the top of my head. You have to look into the data sheet to figure out exactly what the uh, voltage drop from emitter to base is, and then what the total current is, including that voltage drop through all of the resistors all the way to ground. And then you can figure out what the beta is and do some math and figure out what current you're gonna get through the uh, emitter to collector. But I think in this case, they're just uh, using it to push the transistor into saturation. Uh, pretty much they want to move enough current from the emitter to the base so that the transistor tries to move as much current as it physically can from the emitter to the collector. And then once that current is coming out of the collector, it goes straight into our relay. And this is where some really interesting things happen because that we have two commons, two normally opens and two normally closed, but they have tied the normally closed and the common together on one of those and the normally open and the common together on the other. And this is how they're getting that interesting behavior with the intermittent switch where it locks on. So when the LDR is at a high resistance, meaning that there is no light on it, there's not enough current flowing from emitter to base to allow the transistor to turn on. So the relay itself is off. And if we look at the AC lines coming from the wall plug in, one of them goes straight over into the common and then out the normally closed pin all the way over to the other pin of our AC out. So when the relay is not energized, the AC out plug is hot. However, if I shine a light on the LDR, it goes to a low resistance, which allows a certain amount of current to flow from emitter to base, which lets the transistor conduct, pushing power through the coil of the relay, kicking it over. So when the relay is energized, the AC out plug is cold. Now the intermittent switch is actually normally closed, which gives the relay a direct path to ground. However, if we crack open the intermittent switch, now the relay coil only has one path to ground, and that's through the normally open. So we shine a light on the LDR, pulling its value low, allowing the relay to conduct. And then if we open the intermittent switch, the relay still stays energized because now it's going through the normally open. But the second we de-energize the relay, it no longer has a path to ground and it cannot be energized again, regardless of whether we're shining light on the LDR or not. So that's how they're achieving the intermittent functionality. That's a really cool and interesting way to do it. And they did it by just tying the common to the normally closed instead of the normally open. And I think that covers just about everything in here, except for the uh, little 0A-91 diode here. And I believe that's just a flyback diode for the relay coil, so that when you de-energize the relay coil, the inductive spike doesn't kill our PNP transistor. 
So there we have it. We have successfully reverse engineered the Knight photoelectric relay system receiver unit. It's a fairly simple circuit, but I think it's really fascinating. They achieved a lot of really interesting functionality with an absolute bare minimum of parts. So if you've ever used one of these or you have experience playing around with them or even taking them apart, let me know in the comments below because I think it's just a fascinating piece of electronics history. Uh, but anyways, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.